It's about time for us to begin this evening. Appreciate everyone being here tonight. Uh, Brother Robert asked me once again to fill in so uh, while they're on vacation, so I'll be doing that tonight. I'm trying to see if I'm framed up where everybody, where my head's not cut off. I think, I think I've got it right. It's kind of hard to do that back there and come up here, but I think we've got it, we got it set. Actually, before we start, let me check one thing, make sure I've got, don't have the audio messed up back here. Okay. They either get the room audio from that mic, they either get this mic, or they get both, or they get nothing. So I've got to make sure they got the right combination. It's, right now it's just me, so that's, with nobody back there working it, that should work. But uh, we do appreciate everyone being here tonight. Uh, let's begin uh, with a word of prayer before we uh, begin. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful thee for this beautiful day you've given us, for this opportunity we have now to come together to study your word. And we pray, Father, that as we study the Old Testament kings and the prophets, that we'll learn from the, the, the life and times of those kings, from those that were good, from those that were evil. And help us to learn from uh, their examples, both for good and for evil. Help us, Father, to, to always... Uh, Look to learn from from your word as we as we strive to study and learn about more about you and how you'd have us to live. Father, we pray for those of our number that are sick and afflicted, and we pray, Father, your comfort upon them, and you pray that you would restore them to their normal walks of life, if it be your will. And likewise, Father, for those that are um, grieving the loss of loved ones, we pray your comfort on them too, Father. And we also pray, Father, for those that are vacationing and traveling at this time. Pray, Father, that you keep them safe until they return home and uh, Father we pray that you would forgive us when we do wrong and help us to repent from the things that uh, hinder us so that we might serve thee better again be with us as we continue this class tonight in Christ's name we pray amen okay so if I mark correctly we were kind of just starting on page 54 we were in the middle of the section on uh, Jeroboam the second who was not kin to Jeroboam, the first king of Israel. He was from a different line. I believe we covered a little bit of that last week. Um, one thing about this lesson, we got the potential to go through a lot of kings tonight, so we'll see how we go, because a lot of these are had very short histories, or at least the history told in the Bible of them are, are pretty short. So let's... I'm going to do my best to try to keep it straight. I've tried to come up with notes that will help me kind of keep who's who straight. Um, and one other thing, the way that I noticed, didn't really notice it till this week, but the way this book is laid out, uh, sometimes he has sections of questions, and sometimes the questions are right there in the text for the section. So we'll probably believe we'll get very far. We'll probably be reading some of those just directly out of the book because they've got the blanks built in. But anyway, back to Jeroboam the second. Um, he was uh, the son of Joash. Uh, again, he wasn't kin, kin to the first king of Israel who was named jo jo Jeroboam. And uh, Robert covered that last week. If you remember, Basha killed all of Jeroboam's family. So his family was, the, Jeroboam the first family was, was wiped out. Uh, it says Jeroboam the second uh, reigned 41 years. And the interesting thing about him, even though he was an evil king, uh, Israel recovered most of the land of the land they had lost during his reign. Um, there were two primary prophets who were uh, sent during that time. It was Hosea and Amos, and um, thought that was uh, interesting. He goes on. Let's see if it makes sense. <coughs> yeah, we can go on. Um, it's interesting. He he uses the example of Hosea's wife. And um, I sort of vaguely remembered that story, but he mentions here in the text on 55 that um, Hosea personally lived, uh, lived the message of, of how, uh, in effect, Israel had, uh, was committing adultery, you know, not, not in a, the normal sense we use that word, but the fact that they were serving, wor worshiping other gods instead of the true living God. So... In a sense, they were uh, they were committing they were an adulterous generation, 
And Hosea actually lived that message according to, uh, uh, is the way he puts it. Um, God told Hosea to uh, uh, marry a wife of harlotry is how I remember it. Uh, if I remember it correctly is how he told him to, to marry. And he says here, you know, that he, that she was an impenitent adulteress, uh, but he, he was told, the Lord told him to take her back. And the example was what was going on in Israel and the fact that God would take them back if they repented. And it, it also goes on to talk about Amos, who, who was around during that time uh, to, uh, as a prophet. He, um, Jeroboam II didn't receive his message very well, his preaching, and he was told to leave Israel and go back to Judah and basically told him to get out. And uh, the interesting thing about Amos is he was not primarily a prophet. He actually was a, a herdsman and a grower of sycamore figs. And I'll be honest, I didn't know figs grew on a sycamore tree. I didn't know there was a such thing. I've seen fig bushes, fig trees, and they grow what I think of as a fig, so I don't know. Sycamore, it must be the fruit of a sycamore that's, I don't know, I didn't research that, but that was new to me. I didn't, rec didn't recall reading that before. I don't know, has anybody ever <laughs> seen that? That a sycamore tree has figs? Okay. Yeah, that was new to me. But anyway, that was, that was his, uh, his profession, his occupation. He was a herdsman and grower of sycamore figs. So it was not his primary occupation, uh, at least not up to that point. But Amos had been sent to Jeroboam II, um, taking the typical message of repentance and turning back to God. And of course, we know Jeroboam was the second was, was an evil king. And even though God had actually expanded the kingdom back closer to what it was originally, uh, it still didn't uh, seem to, to have an effect. Uh, we had, I think, just started the questions over in blue on 54. Um, the first one I think we covered, it says he restored the border of Israel from the entrance of Hamath as far as the Sea of Ereba. Okay, I thought I heard something different. Uh, the Ereba is the Dead Sea. That they are the same, and I had to check that too. I, I did not re recall that, but the Sea of Ereba is the is the Dead Sea. Not a whole lot of seas in this area uh, that we're familiar that we usually talk about. So, yeah, that is the Dead Sea. So. Um, it says, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke through his servant, Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was of Gath, uh, Hef, Gath Hefer or Hefer. And uh, Robert mentioned last week that that is the Jonah uh, that we usually think of being swallowed by the, by the fish, the one we, uh, that we, uh, we read um, we read about in its own separate book. But that is that, is that Jonah that's... Is he's of the same son and of the same locale. So that is Jonah. That is, uh, and like Robert, I did not recall ever seeing that name and realizing that Jonah, uh, that Jonah had been involved in other parts of the Bible. So that was, that was interesting. So I think we were ready for number two, actually. How is the Lord's mercy factored in this? And he's talking about the res restoration of the borders. I'm sorry? Okay, that was his way of showing mercy. Does anybody else have any? Um, it says in verse 26, 27, he saw that the affliction of Israel was very bitter, that there was no helper for Israel, whether they were bond or free. You know, he, I think it hurt God to see his people, even though they were, they were so unfaithful to him. He looked down and saw that they were... Um, they had no helper. It says they, they, their life was very, their affliction was very bitter. And that was just, it almost seems like that was just too much for the Lord to take. And he, he couldn't, even though they were in the condition they were in, he's still showing his mercy and, and allowed them to regain. And he showed them some favor, even, even though, um, you know, they were, they didn't really deserve it. Number three, was Damascus included in the territory recovered by Jeroboam II? 
to make. Yes. Yes, I got a yes. Verse 28. Verse 28, okay. I got a yes at a question mark in my book. I think I almost wrote no. Um, I might have been trying to read too much into that. Verse 28, it says, um, The rest of the acts of Jeroboam and all he did in his might, how he fought and how he recovered for Israel, Damascus and Hamath, uh, which belonged to Judah. Are they not written in the books of Chronicles of the kings of Israel? Um, I don't know. And honestly, it's not coming to me right now. There was something about the way I read that. I thought perhaps it was referring to Damascus more in a referring to the kingdom there instead of the literal city. And one thing that added to my, and I do think the answer is yes, I ultimately came to the conclusion, I think yes, it is saying he recovered the actual city of Damascus. One thing that threw me off though, I will say, over on 54 it says, um, it refers to the map on the next page. It says the land was almost as great as it was during the time of David and Solomon. But if you look at that map, the boundary of Israel is drawn out there in orange, and it's nowhere near Damascus. Damascus is a lot further north, so it doesn't look like it's encompassing um, Israel uh, or Damascus there. So that's one thing that threw me off. I thought maybe this is a little bit of a trick question. I think it started me reading things into that verse that really aren't there. Uh, let's see, Damascus, that's a little bitty. Probably should have put it on the screen. Damascus is up in the uh, upper right in the yellow uh, above the label Syrian Kingdom of Damascus. And that's interesting. It actually calls it the Kingdom of Damascus. I had not even noticed that. I think of Damascus as the city. Um, but even then, it doesn't seem to stretch that far unless the boundary was further down than it. It, it was just a little confusing to me. Also, if you look at the title of the map, it says it was the divided kingdom in the days of Jehoahaz of Israel, Joash of Judah. So it seems like this, I mean, again, I'm a little confused on what the point was because this doesn't seem to reflect the, the, the uh, boundaries that would have been in place after Jeroboam II regained territory. So anyway. I think that's what threw me off. So I just left it with a yes, with a little question mark, just so I would, I guess, throw that out there and see what anybody, what everybody thinks about that. But I, I do think it does mean that he uh, did recover uh, Hamath and, uh, well, it's asking specifically about Damascus. Um, is there anything more on that one? That's mostly about my confusion than it is anything, but again, <laughs> I like maps. I find maps very interesting, but when they don't match up with what the text is saying, it kind of throws me for a, for a loop. So over on page 56, we're still talking about Jeroboam II. Um, and we're actually over in Amos now. This is from Amos 7.15. This is uh, one of the fill-in-the-blanks that's kind of embedded. It says, but the Lord took me from following the... the flock and the Lord said to me go prophesy to my people Israel okay this is the call to Amos uh, to go to the people to go to Israel and uh, he makes a little point here he says some people like good old fashioned preaching and I guess he meant blunt kind of to the point preaching I think's what he's what he's uh talking about because he quotes Amos there um, from Amos 4.1 and um, he's uh, addressing the it says the luxury loving women of Israel it says hear this word you cows of Bashan who are on the mountain of Samaria so that's how he addressed uh, he was sort of blunt to say the least that's that's that that kind of preaching that kind of uh <laughs> Those kinds of references probably wouldn't fly very well uh, nowadays, but uh, that's apparently he was a, a pretty blunt. Again, that was not his primary job. You know, he he was he was kind of called into that, so maybe that's why he was uh, perhaps a little uh, a little blunt. But I, I thought that was kind of amusing. Talked about it being good old fashioned preaching. 
Um, so in Amos 6 1, he rebuked those who were at ease in. I heard something. Zion, okay, in Zion. And to those who feel secure in the mountain of Samaria, they were not gre grieved. I'll go and give you that one. Over the. Affliction of uh, Joseph. Thus they were warned in Amos 8 2 the end has come for my people Israel. I will pass by them no longer. So he he's basically pronouncing the end of his uh, the end of uh, his people, the end of the end of the the kingdom of Israel. At least it obviously not not immediate the end, but it goes on for a uh, certain number of years past that, so uh, there's a pronouncement of the of the end. So that's everything we have on Jeroboam the second. Any other uh, thoughts on that? We'll move on to uh, the next king, and the next king is actually a king of Judah. And I'm very glad that our author put blue labels, kings of Judah, and then red labels for the kings of Israel. So it's pretty easy to keep up in the book, but. The only thing he forgot to put was good or evil by that. So I started writing that in, good or evil. <laughs> uh, of course, Israel should be pretty easy to remember. They were all evil. They didn't have a good king the whole time. But uh, Uzziah is the next king. Now, he's called Azariah in some places. and some I don't know if that changes per translation or, or what, but he's called Uzziah. And I think there was an Azariah over in Israel, too. So, again, we have some repeating names, some duplicate names. But uh, Uzziah was a good king. It says he reigned 52 years, and he was 16 when he became the king. And he did a lot of good things. If you go to Second Chronicles 26, it talks about all the, all the really good things that he did. And actually, Second Chronicles 26 also kind of sheds some light. Uh, the point's made in the book that if you read the account in Second Kings... There's only a few, I think there's, what, nine verses about Uzziah. And it says that uh, he was a good king, but it states that the Lord struck him with leprosy, but it doesn't explain why. Well, if you go to Second Chronicles 26, uh, you find out why. And uh, so, as I mentioned over there in Second in Chronicles, it mentions all the good things that he did. It says he was successful in war against the Philistines. Um, his army grew very large. I didn't write down a lot of notes about the specifics, but it's, it's the typical type of blessings that, that, that someone who was following God would have received uh, as a king. The problem was, uh, the problem that Uzziah ran into appears to be pride, we have a question there. It says, read, uh, read verses 16 through 23 of that chapter and tell us why, tell why Uzziah became a, a leper. Do you, anybody want to take a crack at that one? Why did he become a, a leper? Do you remember the circumstances surrounding it? Okay. And why couldn't he burn incense in the, in the sanctuary or the holy place I think it was I think that was the holy place it wasn't the most holy but it was the holy place the there you go yeah you know, you're right yeah he wasn't a priest he was a king he wasn't a priest he wasn't one of the Levites and um, it appears that it was just Plain, simple pride, like a lot of like a lot of the causes of uh, a lot of our problems. Uh, it seems like it was pride. You know, he had been prospered. He'd been winning all these wars. He'd been very successful in everything he did. And I don't know. Just reading the account, it almost seems like sound makes it sound like he. Maybe I'm reading this into it, but it just it sounds like he became sort of so pumped up and. <laughs> I don't know what, what caused him, but it sounds like he rushed into the temple and decided to, and I don't know why that particular 
activity was what he wanted to do. But He, he did, and mm -hmm. I was trying to understand what made him think that was the thing to do to start with. It just seemed like he, I, I don't know, it just seemed like he, I don't know if it was, it, obviously it was pride, but was it just a, was there some particular victory that day, or I don't think it tells us, was there something that made him <laughs> want to rush in there and, oh, I should go put it, burn incense on the altar of incense, you know, even though we all know that's a place only the priests can go and it's and it's interesting it says that there were it wasn't just uh, one priest that opposed him there were 80 priests that hurried in there that that went in there and they opposed him and they're sort of put in the middle of <laughs> if you think about it they're sort of put in the middle between between God and the king and you know sometimes it cost priests their lives and they they did the right thing they stood up to him and you know, maybe it was because before all that he had been, a, for all accounts, a good king. But they opposed him. It says 80 of them opposed him. Um, I forget the dimensions, but that had to be a lot of people in the in the, the sanctuary there because I don't think that the holy place was that. I forget the, I forget the dimensions of it. It was obviously large enough for that many people, but it was not just a huge area, I don't think. Um, but anyway, they opposed him, and he didn't actually burn incense on the, he, he fully intended to. It says he had a censer in hand for burning it, and, and he, as Dwight said, he was enraged with the priest. He was very upset with them, but that's when the leprosy broke out on his forehead. Apparently, it just broke out right then and there for everyone to see, and uh, when that happened, it says the chief priests and all the priests looked at him and behold he was leprous on his forehead it says they hurried him out of there they didn't want that in the temple they hurried him out of there and he and it says he also he himself also hastened to get out because the lord had smitten him i think that's the point of reality that hit him there so uh oh i've messed up because he i thought it said they buried him but he buried him in a separate does it? Yeah, it, and as far as his burial, yeah, it, it says the field of the grave which belonged to the kings. But that was not normally where a king would have been buried, was was my understanding of that. That was more of an isolated, separate. It was a not not an honored placement of his grave. You know, it was because he was uh, a leper. Um, it's funny the things you run into when you start googling googling things. And I googled something about Uzziah just just out of curiosity. I've, you know, you see images and you see, uh, this was like an, uh, there was a f picture of what they believed was his grave marker, which was probably put on a, it probably wasn't a, in the ground, it was probably more of a cave type, a tunnel type grave. But anyway, it had a sign, I forget, it mentioned his name and everything, but the last thing it said was, uh, it said his bones, Uzziah's bones are here, do not open. <laughs> It, they said that was the last line of the text. It said, "Do not open." It was just it looked just like a tile. It just had a little border around it, and then it had, uh, I guess, Hebrew writing in the middle of it. But I thought that was interesting. Do not open. You know, I don't think it said he had this guy had leprosy, but it said, "Do not open." So they may have been. If that really was his marker, they they may have <laughs> done that uh, out of concern for because uh, leprosy was a, a a a big big deal if you got it, big problem. And uh, so, yeah, he, but it's interesting. He was struck almost immediately, you know. Uh, it seems like he was okay when he got in there. 
and they were opposing him. But when he grabbed that censer and he was ready to put the incense on the fire himself, it, it was that was too far. He had, he his intention was that he was going to go through with it, and that seems to be when he was he was smitten. But even he realized I've messed up. I think that was the moment of reality that hit him and said, "Oh no, I've, I've got to get out of here. Bad things are happening." So you know that's that smack in the face. I think that that the Lord gave him and said, "You, you know you've." You've done well till now, but you've messed up. So anyway, they hurried him out, and it says he, he hurried out himself. And the sad thing is, because he was a leper, and apparently he was a leper until he died, it was not a, a case of going to the priests and going through the cleanliness rituals and, and being healed of it. Uh, it seems like this was a, a curse that God left on him the rest of his life. So he had to live in a separate house. Even though he was the king, he had to live in a separate house, and he was cut off from the house of the Lord. It says Jotham his son was the king over his house judging the people of the land. So essentially Jotham became the functional king of the of the kingdom at that point on. Um, we know he became king officially later on but uh, it seems that Jotham came, uh, came to be king, came to basically have all the functions of the king at that point. And then it tells us about his death which we just talked about. Uh, I don't remember where I read it, but somewhere I read that it's it's thought that Uzziah lived with leprosy about 11 years, about the last 11 years of his life. So that was a good a good long period, if that's correct. Like I say, I don't I don't remember seeing that in scripture. That was just something I uh, something I saw. If you if you start looking too much, you'll see there's a lot of opinions on dates. And Robert mentioned a, having a nice chart of the a timeline of the kings. And uh, I found a lot of those online, and they're all relatively similar. The thing that kind of blew my mind on them, and I, I debated on trying to get one and show it. First of all, they're eye charts. They're very hard to read if you just put them on a, on a screen uh, here in the auditorium. But a lot of them show overlap between the kings. And I don't know if that's taking into account transitional time. That seemed to be the explanation. But a father and son would have overlapping timelines and I don't know if that's based on, because I didn't do all the research, if you go back and look at the, I mean, it tells us when, what year of a king, another kingdom they started ruling and how long they did. So you probably can do the math, and I guess that's based on that, but I've never sat down and, and gone through that. I never had really noticed that. Never, I, when we read it here, it sounds like the kingdom goes to here, this king dies, then this king takes over and goes. And in some cases, the timelines do have straight lines, but other times they're, they're sort of this L-shaped connection between the two, and you have two kings that are, I don't know if that's intended to be a transitional, not knowing all the ins and outs of how they did that back then, I don't know. If a king was near death, did they transition? Did they have a time when the sun would sort, sort of transition? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know how that works, so... Anyway, I debated showing something like that. I didn't want to cause confusion because it's confusing to me. Yes? You mentioned that he was becoming aware that he was catching the leprosy. It doesn't say what kind of pain that caused him. Did you just see the white on his skin or was he actually in pain inside his body? I mean, I don't expect an answer. But That's a good point. Um, what, is it, what does it say? I kind of thought about that when, I, when we were talking. It's Okay, he realized. It may have been simply based on... The, I mean, he had 81 witnesses, number one. He had 80, 80 priests plus the high priests that were looking at him. And I, <laughs> I guess that's uh, unless there was, I, I don't know. I don't know if there's immediate pain, if it's something you would feel coming on. I mean, obviously this was, I would assume this is some sort of a, a miraculous case of leprosy. This isn't something that was caught and then was developing getting worse like a like a real a normal case of it was this was he was stricken so it seems that this developed immediately it says this this popped up on his forehead right as they're in there opposing him so uh i don't know based on the 81 people who were uh priests who were shocked at his appearance and i don't know if he could feel the sores i that's a good Good question. It's one of those we don't know the answer to, but but it is interesting. No, I, I I understand what you're what you're saying because that could have been a really good fake. <laughs>
hey, you're getting leprosy, you need to get out of here. Um, no, but I did think, it, you know, it took a lot of courage for those priests to oppose him, and obviously it did anger him greatly, and he, he could have wreaked, wreaked havoc on them if he really wanted to. Um, it appears that he, he learned very quickly that he was in the wrong. Um, again, he, otherwise being a good king, it's just a, it's a blight on his, on his uh, record overall because overall he was, uh, he, he was regarded as a, as a really good, one of the better kings of, of Judah. Okay, anything else on him, on Uzziah or Azariah? That's all I had. Okay, so we're back to page 56 toward the bottom. We're back to a king of Israel. And the next one is Zechariah. And there's not a lot said about him. He only reigned six months. Uh, it says he was the fourth generation after Jehu. And that's actually um, important. Tell you what, this is one of those sections that has the, that's mostly blank. So let's just read through. Uh, it's important to remember that Zechariah is a de descendant of Jehu, the fourth one to the reign to reign in that dynasty. God's previous promise to Jehu, your sons to the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. Then the text adds, and so it was, verse 12, when he had only reigned, when he reigned only, Zechariah was assassinated by. Okay, Shalom, son of Jabesh. I got in this habit of writing the son of after just like I'm going to remember that, but <laughs> I've, made, I've gotten the habit of doing that lately. Um, seemed to be a key in identifying people uh, in, that, in that time. So Jehu had been promised that four more generations of his sons would reign, and so they did. Zechariah was the fourth. And he only lasted six months before he was assassinated. So that ended that, ended that promise, that, uh, that fulfilled the promise that God had made to him. So that's really all we know about Zechariah. That, uh, that ended that reign and ended that, that, um, that chain of, of sons of Jehu. Now... We're going to see there's sort of a lot, of, there's a lot of, it seems to be a lot of mayhem ensues over the next several kings. Uh, we mentioned Shalom. It says Shalom, and again, let's, let's just do the blanks. Shalom reigned full month in Samaria, but as Jesus warned that men who live by the sword shall perish by the sword, Shalom was assassinated by by Menahem. So he got a full month, it says. Uh, doesn't say a lot about him. He was evil. He was an evil king. Get back to Second Kings. I don't believe that there's, I don't believe any of these next four kings are in uh, Second Chronicles. Okay, so interestingly, the the Israel, and if you go back to the chart that's at the beginning of the book, it, it has asterisks showing when the dynasties change. And I think the next three out of four <laughs> um, were the results of assassination. So obviously it's not a move from uh, generation to generation. So Menahem... The son of Gadi uh, assassinated uh, Shalom, so he became king. And it says Menahem was a was a very cruel king. Uh, he reigned ten years, so even in his cruelty and his brutality, he he did have a, a decent time to reign. He wasn't as short as some of the others. Um, but it says he was he was a cruel king. Um, I'm jumping ahead again. Let's go through the, the blanks uh, on that section as well. It says he was a cruel king. He attacked the, king, the city of Tip, Tipsha and I 
I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I think all who were there. Uh, I've got he he ripped up all its women who were with child. Oh, okay. There you you filled it from another. Okay, I may have the wrong. I may have answered. I may have filled that blank with something they didn't intend. Okay. Uh, during Menahem's reign. Was the king of Assyria, Pool, Pool or Pool? He's short one L if it's Pool in English. Uh, Pool, king of Assyria, came up against Israel, and Menahem gave him a thousand talents of silver. And the interesting thing about that thousand talents of silver it says he forced all the men of wealth to pay fifty shekels each in order to make up this thousand to pay the king of Assyria. So he was one that instead of trying to build an army and consult with God and do what God told him to do, um, I mean, there's not any mention or any implication that he may have even been a follower, you know, of God. Uh, but it says he exacted the money from Israel. He got, he got the money, basically, the thousand... Um, talents uh, by getting 50 shekels of Syria from each each of the of the uh, wealthy wealthy men and that's really about all it tells us uh, about him it just says he slept with his fathers and that uh, Pekiah I guess uh, is, is his uh, son and the interesting thing about him, yeah, there's no blanks in the next section, so I'll just read through it. It says the account's very brief, but one thing that's noteworthy, uh, he actually received the kingdom as heir. He was the first one in a while who hadn't, didn't have to kill somebody to get, uh, to get the throne. So he actually inherited the throne from his father Menahem. Um, but it says that he did evil as well. He only reigned for two years. Um, and then he was assassinated by Pekah. Um, who was the son of R Ramalia and it says it was his officer so uh, so he was the victim it sounds like of a conspiracy uh, to kill the king so then under Pekah it says then Pekah son of Ramalia his officer blank conspired against him and struck him in Samaria in the castle of the king's house with Argob and Aria and with him were 50 men of the Gileadites, and he killed, killed him and became king in his place. Sorry. <laughs> it's hard not to read the, the written word sometimes. He became king in his place. So uh, we have one brief respite there where, where the, the throne was, um, was inherited, and then now we're back to, to assassinations. So, next, over on page 58, getting pretty close here, um, we'll go back to the kings of Judah, and we've got two more, two kings of Judah, first one being Jotham, and we mentioned him earlier, uh, that he was the son of, um, uh, of Uzziah, I have to go back, have that. That's what gets confusing. We're having to jump back and forth. He was the son of Uzziah. Uh, he, he reigned 16 years, and he was 25 when he became king. And it talks, the scriptures talk about a lot of the good things that he did, uh, things that he built. Um, and talks about how he fought the Ammonites and defeated them. And says the Ammonites actually paid him in silver, wheat, and barley, and he became a mighty, a mighty king. So it says that he um, was a good king, but he learned from the sin of his father. Obviously, Isaiah had broken a boundary; it wasn't to be broken, and he obviously learned from that. So he makes the point here that you know that was something he uh, he he was good like his father, except for the the big mistake that his father made. He learned from that. 
But it says, though he was a good, right in the middle of that paragraph, it says, though he was a good king, the, the people continued blank, blank. Okay. The people continued to act corruptly. So there was a problem in the land, even though they had a good king. In this case, the citizenry was, was still corrupt. Um, and he ends here by saying, How such a good father can be succeeded by such a wicked son is difficult to understand. But when Jotham died, Ahaz, his son, reigned in his place. And we'll learn uh, when we continue on that Ahaz was one of the more evil kings in Judah. And it's just hard to fathom sometimes that such an evil king would come from such a good king. And I heard a bell and I see a few people shuffling. So we'll... Uh, I'll mark the book at Ahaz for next week, and I'm assuming Robert will be back. Uh, appreciate everyone uh, participating tonight and helping me through. Thank you. Thanks.
on the PowerPoint. <laughs> In need of grace. Father, we are so thankful to Thee for this beautiful day that You've given us, for this opportunity we have to come together at the end of this day to worship Thee, to study Your Word, and to sing these songs to Your praise and honor and glory, and to come to Thee in prayer. Father, we just pray that our service here tonight has been pleasing unto Thee, that Your name has been glorified, and that we've been lifted up in Your in Your faith as, as we've gone through the classes and the various activities of the, of the hour. Father, we're so thankful to Thee for blessing us in this life, for giving us the things that we need, and many times blessing us far beyond the things that we just need, and help us to be always to be good stewards of the things You've blessed us with, so we may bless others. Father, most of all, we're thankful to Thee for Your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, for Your great love and show that You showed to us in sending Him here, and His great love and obeying your command and fulfilling his commitment to be a sacrifice for our sins father and we pray you'll help us to live our lives worthy of that sacrifice each day help us to teach others the good news of the gospel so so that they also may benefit from the free gift of salvation father we're thankful to you for this congregation of the church and we pray father that you would always help us to be what you'd have us to be help us to serve thee and this community help us to be a light to the community so that others may be brought to thee before it's too late father we pray again for those that are numbers that are sick we pray father your blessings on them and for those that minister to them and pray your we restore their health if it be your will and likewise for those that are grieving the loss of loved ones father we pray your comfort upon them father we ask you to forgive us when we 
do wrong. We realize we often sin and do things we shouldn't do and, and often leave undone things we should and help us to do better in the future than we have in the past so it might stand justified in your sight. And Father, we pray that at the end of life's way that, that if we are found faithful that you'll give us the home in heaven that you've promised us through the blood of Jesus and by your grace and mercy. That all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening. Our invitation this uh, evening will be coming from John chapter 3. John chapter 3. The New King James Version. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now let's just stop there for a minute. Here's Nicodemus, a Pharisee. Says he's a ruler of the Jews. In other words, he, he has authority. And let's put ourselves in, in his position. What if we had been the, the Nicodemus of that time? You know, he lived under the old law, the Mosaic law, as we call it. And uh, Jesus has been born and, and comes to him and, and tells him, Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you can't go to heaven. Nicodemus says to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? No, that's a, that's a natural question wasn't it, that Nicodemus is asking. How can I enter my mother's womb again at, at my age and be born again? He didn't understand, did he? Jesus, verse 5, Jesus answered, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. The water he's talking about here is the water of baptism. And the Spirit he's talking about here is the Holy Spirit that God gives us when we are baptized in the water. Verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The winds blow where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes and from where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Has anyone here ever seen the wind? I, I haven't. I haven't seen the wind, but I have seen the result of wind, the result of what it does, and we've all seen that. We've all seen huge trees that you can't reach around, blown down by strong winds or tornadoes. But we didn't see the wind, did we? We just seen the effect that it had. So Jesus here is speaking of spiritual things, not, not physical things not fleshy things. Verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen and you not you, you do not receive our witnesses. I have told you earthly things, and you do not believe. 
How will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man, who is in heaven. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And now verse 16, John 3, 16, one of the most often quoted verses in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Our question to each one here tonight, have you been born again? Have you been born of water and of the Spirit? If you hadn't, you can't go to heaven. It says plainly here that God gave His Son, His only beloved Son, to die on that cruel cross of Calvary, that through the shedding of His precious blood, the giving of his body on the cross for each one, for each one of you, for me, for all that has lived before and all that will live in the future. No, Jesus is not going to die on the cross again. The scripture tells us he died once for all. Once for all. So tonight, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a child of God, why wait? Why put it off any longer? No, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. We may die in our sleep tonight. We may die in a wreck on the way home from church tonight. We don't know. The thing that we need to do is to be, be ready. Be ready for when that time comes. And if you aren't ready, you can make that right even tonight, even this hour. Don't put it off any longer. If you're subject, come forth as we sing this invitation. Oh, just as I am.
appreciate your little attendance tonight. Did anybody get an account? 45. 45. That's a good number for a midweek service. Does anyone have announcements or anything about the sick or anything that needs to be mentioned at this time? Let's go to God in prayer. Father, thank you again for this good day that we've had, this good uh, Bible study that we've had here tonight. We pray that we've all learned something about how to better serve you, uh, better be, be pleasing children in your sight. Father, we ask your continued blessing on those that are sick, those that are undergoing tests and treatments. Just bless them as long as you know how. Bless those that are traveling. Give them a safe trip to their des destination and back home. Be with us through this rest of the week. Bring us back at the next appointed time. Forgive our sins, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. 